Uh, thank you, Mia. Um, <clears throat> Once again, we're gonna zip through some desexing clinics for cats and dogs and, and recognize that um, at the ASPCA, somewhere back in the, uh, I guess the late 70s, we decided that one of the things that we needed to do was to try to reduce our intake by uh, desexing animals. And I'm gonna start with this slide which talks about the terminology because um, I've been lecturing about pediatric spaying and neutering for quite a while and when I first started sort of looking into it, I said, we have so many different terms for this. It's almost as if we don't want people to know what we're doing. It's like a secret, you know, procedure. But we call it spaying and neutering in the States, so if I slip up and, and, and call it that, you'll know what I'm speaking about. <clears throat> and I tried to change all of my slides to say desexing. So, but we, we talk about we're sterilizing animals, we're doing a gonadectomy, we're neutering them, we're fixing them. If it's a male animal, we're neutering them, but that also means we're doing an orchiectomy, which is also a castration. If we're doing female animals, we're spaying them, which could be an ovariohysterectomy, where we remove the ovaries and the uterus, but it could just be an ovarectomy, where we're just removing the ovaries. And certainly in the States, we're more used to doing the ovariohysterectomy, but in Europe and in some other countries, they're more accustomed to doing the ovariectomy. And when I went to the Caribbean, <clears throat> they refer to it as cutting. So we've got lots of terminology, but essentially what we're talking about is desexing. And I, I kind of like that, so um, hopefully I'll uh, be able to, to keep using that as my point of reference. But I'm going to talk about a, a lot of different models of desexing clinics because at the ASPCA, we decided that we were going to subsidize spaying and neutering. So I ran a clinic for the ASPCA in a low-income area in uh, Brooklyn, and essentially it was my goal to get every animal desexed no matter what. I did it for free. I did everything but go to the people's house and pick the animals up. And literally would have people begging me to uh, allow them to bring their animals in, and we would do it for free, and they wouldn't show up. And that was really frustrating for us. And then we recognized that there's got to be some other models for us to get this done. So I'm going to talk about several different models. There's the, the MASH model, which is the mobile spay-neuter clinic. We had an in-house uh, clinic at the ASPCA that was actually in the shelter. We now run a, a series of mobile clinics that go into different communities and do the spaying and neutering. And then we also have a stationary clinic both in our hospital and also an off-site clinic that just does um, desexing. So one of the things I want to start out with is talking about high-quality, high-volume spay-neuter. <clears throat> and I use spay-neuter there because that's the phraseology that the ASV task force was using, and I didn't feel that I should, should change that. But in 2008, they decided to come up with some guidelines for spay-neuter because they were being challenged by the local practitioners and by other organizations, by regulatory agencies, and so on and so forth that were questioning their ability to do large numbers of spay-neuter procedures in such a short period of time. <clears throat> so they decided to um, research the gu and create guidelines for these uh, clinics to use. And they defined it as high quality, high volume, which is sort of a mouthful, but because we wanted to say that just because we're doing high volume doesn't mean that it's low quality. And that's the, the charge that was being leveled at these clinics all the time. Well, if you can do 50 animals in a day, you must be taking shortcuts. If you can do it for $10, you must be doing low quality procedures. And so we wanted to make it clear that it is high quality and it is high volume. And that these are efficient surgical initiatives that meet or exceed veterinary medical standards of care. And certainly it was important for us to be able to say that we're, we're going to beat what you are doing in private practice. We're going to do a better job because we want to put to rest those charges that we're not doing a good job and that we don't care about our, our, our clients and our patients. And that these medical standards of care will help us in providing accessible, targeted sterilization of large numbers of dogs and cats in order to reduce their overpopulation thank you, and subsequent euthanasia. And these guidelines were published in 2008 by the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association. 
And what we're trying to prove is that you can achieve high quality surgery by implementing very efficient systems and protocols that maintain those standards. So, no, we've been charged with using the same surgical pack over and over on several animals. We don't do that. We have monitoring equipment. These animals are examined. They are receiving the same care and sometimes better care than what happens in some private practices. And I was on the State Board of Veterinary Medicine in New York State for 10 years, and I can tell you that I got lots of cases that uh, were negligent and incompetent that came out of the private practice world uh, more so than from what was happening in, in the shelter. So they're not equivalent. Low cost does not mean low quality. And recognizing that by using these very efficient systems and training technicians to keep animals moving to the surgeon's table and having surgeons who know how to use economy of movement um, they can, in fact, become very efficient. And I was skeptical at first. When I heard you know, people say that they could spay a cat in five minutes or three, I, I have to see that. Because I'm thinking that, they, again, I'm like the rest of the world. They must be taking some shortcuts and seeing that what you want is people who are doing the same thing over and over again, and they learn how to do it very quickly and very efficiently. And it's what they always tell us. If you have to have surgery, you want to go to a surgeon who has done hundreds of those procedures. You don't want a surgeon that's only done one or two. And most private practitioners only do a handful of spays and, and neuters in a day. And yet our, our surgeons are, are highly trained for this. And there's a, a group called Humane Alliance in North Carolina that actually runs a training program. And veterinarians and technicians come from around the country to learn uh, some of these techniques. And this is the article, um, the Association of Sheltered Veterinarians, Veterinary Medical Care Guidelines for Spay-Neuter Programs. And this is certainly more than you will find in the private sector. They don't have the guidelines that we have. So this is readily accessible on the uh, JAVMA magazine if anybody's interested. But now let's, let's take a look at some of these clinic styles. And, and this first one I want to talk about is a mash style dissection clinic. And this is a mobile unit that goes to various areas in need within a certain geographic um, area and does spaying and neutering or desexing. I'm not going to get this right, guys. Forgive me. I'm just, just trying to teach an old dog new tricks. Some you can, but some you can't. <laughs> and getting saying desexing is going to be a challenge for me. But these programs have a lower startup cost. They are, are quicker startup time. Um, the program that I'm most familiar with has a very large core of volunteers, which helps keep the cost down. And they work with and assist multiple organizations. And what was really admirable about the program that um, I'm going to talk about in a second that's in upstate New York is that they actually got all of the shelter and rescue groups to work together at a point in time where they were barely talking to each other. Now, there can be some wear and tear on the equipment and on the staff. You do need to have a large core of volunteers. There has to be a home base for the vehicle, and you need to identify locations. So what this vehicle actually does, it may go to the shelter and actually do the spaying and neutering, desexing, or they may go to a local fire station, they may go to a, a local school, community center. They look for locations where they can actually take their equipment and set up shop, and then the local uh, rescue groups, shelters, so on and so forth, bring the animals to those locations. Okay, so this is a typical um, unit, and you can see all of the equipment is loaded up there, and then they go to a, a site that's pre-selected, and again, the animals are brought to that location. So Shelter Outreach Services was started in 2003 in upstate New York. They desex approximately 10,000 cats and dogs per year. And as I said, it, it's resulted in a lot of co collaboration between these uh, shelters and rescue groups. And the woman that runs that program was actually uh, teaching spay and neutering at uh, Cornell University and kind of got a lot of resistance from the university and decided, you know what, um, I'm going to go out and do this on my own. She didn't have a lot of money for startup, so she just loaded up a vehicle and started talking to shelters, and that's how this program has grown and expanded since 2003. And this is one of the locations. Um, they have some stationary equipment, but they take most of their equipment with them. It's not always the perfect, ideal setup, but certainly um, they have tracked their um, infection rates, complication rates, and so on and so forth, and it's certainly no higher than what we see in private practice. 
So then we have our in-shelter desexing clinics, and that's um, another model that we used at the ASPCA, and that was so that we could desex animals prior to getting them adopted. So we don't have to transport animals. It can be less expensive because we're not using uh, private practitioners and their practices, and typically the focus is on desexing the shelter animals, but we've also come to realize that you know, the shelters are, are just a very small source of the animal population. Most people are not acquiring their pets from the shelters. And if we sort of restrict our activities to just shelter animals, we're not going to make a dent in the overpopulation problem. So a lot of these facilities are opening up to accept animals that belong to the public. Uh, <clears throat> one of the big challenges that we faced was disease control and trying to make sure that we were able to uh, separate the animals that came in from the public from the shelter animals because the last thing we wanted to do was have uh, an owned animal come in and uh, pick up parvo from our shelter. You know, but uh, knock on wood, our shelter clinic ran for about 15 years and we never had an incident of uh, an animal picking up a disease from um, our shelter, but that was very, due to very scrupulous sanitation and separation of the animal populations. Um, private practitioners may object, you know, and we work very hard to try to work with them collaboratively and say that we're just doing this one procedure, you know, and you should actually be happy to have us do it because we know that you all lose money on every desexing procedure that you perform. So this is a, a desexing clinic in the Richmond SPCA in Virginia, and they take animals from the shelter, from the public, and they do free roaming cats. And their goal is to do 65 surgeries per day using two veterinarians and a, a well-trained medical staff. And, and that may sound like a lot, but I know some clinics that do even more than 65 a day. So their animal control officers distribute educational material in, in areas that are targeted for desexing. I've uh, been down in Grenada and seen where they have a van that drives around. And people actually run up to the van to ask them uh, when can they make an appointment to take their animals in to be desexed at the shelter's clinic. So this can be a very successful model for desexing. Then we have our, our mobile um, desexing clinics. And the ASPCA runs, uh, we started out with one mobile clinic. And it's evolved to the point now where we have five mobile clinics, and we travel to populations in need. It's a self-contained unit. Uh, we can use those vehicles for adoption events. We've used it if there's a disaster. Um, when we had 911, we took our, our mobile clinic and went down to the site to, to help with the rescue efforts if there were animals that were at risk. And it does create a real presence in the community. Um, these are expensive units to buy, and they're expensive to maintain. Okay, they, they have a dedicated driver who has to be paid. There's insurance for the vehicle. Um, these clinics are custom built, and the first one we had was very small. The very first one that I, I visited was down in Houston, Texas, and it was huge. It was like this huge mobile van, and it had a bathroom, and uh, it was just spectacular. But in New York City, where the streets are a lot you know, more narrow, we had to have a much smaller van and, and one of the um, problems we had was we didn't have a toilet so anytime we parked that unit in the community we had to have access to an electrical source where we could plug in for the equipment and we also tried to make sure that somebody would let us use the bathroom so you know in, in New York that could be more of a challenge than you might think um, but we also have problems with making sure that we have a safe place to park the vehicle um, the, one of the issues or concerns with this type of a clinic is that all of the animals come in very early in the morning, and at our clinics, they, the people start lining up around 7 o'clock in the morning. It's first come, first served. Okay, so we used to do it by appointment, and we had such a huge no-show rate that we decided, you know what, let's just see what happens if we just say first come, first serve. And so people start lining up at 7 a.m. in the morning, <clears throat> and they're advised that they may have to wait up to two hours to have the animal admitted, and that the staff shows up and starts doing the admissions around 8 o'clock, and the cutoff is 9. Surgeries take place during the day, and the animals are discharged around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You have to have some type of a backup system in case people do not show up to pick up the animals, what happens to them then at the uh, ASPCA in New York. 
we are fortunate that if that happened, they could come and bring the animals to our own stationary clinics, but in uh, other setups, that's not going to be possible. So there has to be some type of a follow-up process where you get phone numbers for clients so that you can call them if they're not going to be on time or if there's complications from the surgery and you don't feel that that animal can be discharged at that point in time, you, you will have to make alternate arrangements. Um, we do um, provide service to shelters, to rescue groups, to feral cat givers. Our programs are primarily targeted towards owners who are on public assistance. So if you show proof of food stamps or welfare or anything like that, it costs $5. We will do it for other owners who cannot pr show proof. But for those owners, it's about $125, which the going rate um, for desexing an animal in New York City is $300 and up. So even $125 is a bargain. And the point that I make that, um, you know, we, we're, we're so concerned about people who can afford these services are going to take advantage and make it difficult for people who really can't afford it to access these services. But I don't know too many people who could afford it that are going to stand on a, a sidewalk for two hours hoping that they can get their animal in uh, for, this, for this type of a procedure. So here's one of our clinics, and we've actually had folks come and visit to say that this is kind of, this is nicer than what I have in my own practice. And in New York City, because space is at such a premium, this actually is a, a, a very nice clinic that we have. And, and it, it's impressive when you go and you see how clean it is and that we have all the modern monitoring equipment. It could be a little bit claustrophobic. You have to get used to that. But we have a very dedicated staff that really can uh, move these animals through. And we have um, tracked our complication rates. And we have a call center in um, the ASPCA that's actually located in Illinois. So it's very interesting. If somebody has a complication and the actual program is in New York City, if they call the call center, the call gets routed to Illinois. And it gets routed back to tell people what they need to do. And it may be that there's a question that they're concerned about the way the animal looks. We have professional staff there that can advise them whether or not to seek emergency care and also to tell them where to go if, in fact, they do need to get emergency care. And then a stationary desexing clinic is probably the, the model that we're most familiar with because that's what happens in private practices. And they can certainly focus on large numbers of surgeries. They're self-contained units. Uh, one of the things that we also do with our stationary um, clinic was that we would go and, and pick up animals and have a transport system where people can't always access your stationary location. And we actually started a separate location out in an outer borough because we were finding that people that were dealing with feral cats, for example, didn't have access to public transportation to come into the city where our primary clinic was located. And so <clears throat> um, we opened up another uh, clinic in the outlying uh, borough. But the startup costs for these are obviously higher. It takes longer to get it set up. There's building and, and zoning laws and maintenance laws and so on and so forth that can create sometimes barriers for um, getting these programs started. And again, you have to be aware that access can be difficult. And when I pointed out earlier uh, in the presentation was that even though we were doing it for free, you'd be amazed at just any little thing that would interrupt a person's resolve to bring that cat in that day. It could be something like the neighbor was going to bring them and the neighbor's car broke down, their, their child got sick that day and they had to stay home and they couldn't bring the animal. And so we're really looking at how can we make this more accessible to people and that's why we have so many different models um, that I've just outlined. So with that, I was asked to speak about, um, oh, I forgot about this. This is something that's um, fairly recent that we've been doing. And that's targeting and measuring impact. And it's appropriate to follow behind what um, Sharon was, was talking about in terms of statistics and data. And while we recognize that all desexing is important, but if we have limited resources, what we want to do is focus on desexing animals that are most at risk of entering our shelters. Okay, so we need to be able to measure the impact of, of our desexing. So what we're doing at the ASPCA is we're using GIS, which is a geographic information system. And this comes right off of their website, 
which is a system that integrates hardware, software, and data for capturing, managing, analyzing, and displaying all forms of geographically referenced information. And so what we're trying to do with that is look at the shelter's intake data and see where are the animals coming from. And that way, if we know that we have a high intake from a certain area, then that's where we're going to send our mobile clinic. That's where we're going to, to focus our efforts, because that's where we need to reduce the intake. So it's really looking at wh what community. We were, at one point, we were trying to do it by zip codes. And now we're actually looking at what is the actual location where animals are being relinquished and, and, and trying to target and track that information so that we can then go and um, target those services. And so, again, on ASPCA Pro, you'll find a lot more information about GIS. It's not inexpensive. We got a grant from PetSmart Charities to do this. We hired somebody to track this information for us, and the grant was for a quarter of a million dollars. But you'll be able to access this type of service, we think, at universities and at, at other um, sites and companies that are offering this. And this is essentially what a cat intake map would look like. And so where are we going to target? That's where our intake's coming from. That's where we want our mobile clinics to be stationed at. So um, just very quickly, um, to just sort of let you know that you can follow the progress. We're, we're tracking the intake data. And you'll be able to see what's going on on ASPCA.pro with that. So now I want to talk a little bit about pediatric desexing. And how many people here are, are, are veterinarians are actually doing the pediatric procedures? Don't you like it better than doing the... <laughs> It's this, we would think, we've been doing this since the late 1970s, okay? This is not something new, and yet we're still trying to get across that this is safe and that it's appropriate. And the reason that it came about, and I recall working in the shelter, and it came to our attention that we were adopting out animals, and the offspring of those animals were coming back into the shelter. We were part of the problem. And so pre-adoption desexing began because of this. We couldn't get people to comply with the adoption agreements that said that they would desex the animals. They would simply change their mind and say, I don't want to do it. Were we going to go and take those animals away from them? We already had more animals than we knew what to do with. So we said, what we're going to do is we're going to start desexing them before they leave here. So we started doing that. But we had this rule that they had to be six months of age. And that's what I was taught. I mean, I was a firm adherent to that. Um, and then somebody said, well, why do they have to be six months? That's because that's what they told us. Well, who told you? Well, I was at vet school. Well, what was that based on? I don't know. I don't remember. They taught me a lot of stuff I don't remember. Uh, but they must have had a good reason for it. And then you start looking around and saying, well, you know what? It, it was a convenience thing. It was about the anesthesia. There are lots of reasons. But nothing that we really felt was firm enough or important enough for us to say, you know what, let's just keep putting out these animals who are intact and still reproducing. So pediatric um, surgery is generally defined. We use an age of 6 to 16 weeks. A lot of us are doing it. We're guessing at the age of animals. There's some vets that are doing it and don't even realize that they're doing it because they're going by dentition and guessing at the animal's age. And then some folks use a weight limit. They won't do anything that's other uh, one kilogram or two pounds. So this was uh, Dr. Mackey in 1991. He did a study and said that, you know, litters are born to at least 20% of the pet-owning households before those animals are desexed. So these are accidental oops litters because people don't realize, you know, what age that, you know, cats can reach sexual maturity and actually breed. And even I was kind of stunned to find out, you know, four months uh, it could happen. So um, Mar Marvin Mackey was sort of a pioneer of this. Leo Lieberman was a pioneer of getting us started on doing it, and it's been going on since at least uh, the late 1970s, early 80s. It's been endorsed by a lot of different organizations. The theriogenologists, who are the um, reproductive experts in veterinary medicine, they've endorsed it, AVMA the American Animal Hospital Association, so on and so forth. We've had studies from Cornell and Texas A&M that have established short and long-term safety. We're getting a lot of studies now that question the, the safety of these procedures, and most of those studies conclude by saying we need more research. Now, Margaret Ruth Kustrix and Jan Scarlett uh, at University of Minnesota and at Cornell, respectively, have looked at the veterinary literature and sort of determined that we have never actually established the optimum age for neutering. 
But um, again, we've been doing it for 30 years. There's no smoking gun that says um, this, is, this is dangerous. So what are the advantages? There's less fat, there's less bleeding, the tissues are more elastic, you can visualize what you're doing, there's less suturing. Really great, there's less stress on the patient and the surgeon. And most, as we saw from the, the you know, sort of informal poll I did right here, most surgeons would rather do it on these younger animals than uh, the, your traditional age animals. The animals wake up from anesthesia much more quickly, they heal faster, it's much less expensive because you're using fewer drugs, you're using less anesthetic, fewer surgical materials. The animals can go home the same day. Some clinics are holding animals overnight, they're holding them two and three days. These animals wake up about an hour after the procedure is finished, they're eating and running around, shortly after that they can go right home. So look at the size, this is a, an American penny, very small of a, a puppy and a kitten uterus. And um, I don't have uh, the adult for comparison, but as you can see, that, that's pretty small. With the um, puppies, we do them like we do cats. Uh, again, less suturing, less bleeding, uh, a much faster, less stressful procedure. Things that we need to be concerned about, pediatric patients are predisposed to hypoglycemia because they have decreased glycogen stores. So you avoid hypoglycemia by feeding a small meal two hours before surgery. No more fasting overnight. You try to make sure they're not overly excited before the procedures are performed. You apply a little Caro syrup or uh, Nutri-Cal or something like that on their gums when they're recovering and feed them almost as soon as they're up and walking around. And certainly we don't do that with the traditional age patients. Um, with regards to hypothermia, that you've got to keep them warm because of their low body weight and high surface area. So we keep our litter mates together. We reduce contact with cold surfaces. We don't clip as much hair from them. Uh, we use a warm surgical scrub. So instead of using um, alcohol, we use something like betadine and limit the body cavity exposure. We make much smaller incisions. We work much faster. And in some cases, we even reverse the anesthetic agents at the end of surgery. And we do use less multimodal analgesia in these animals because surgery is so quick um, that what we give them usually lasts them for quite a while. And these are just some things that we use. Uh, you can just take gloves and, and put warm water in them, heat up your lactated ringers, things like that. So, Keep them warm. You can use a scrotal approach on the puppies. You need to tattoo them so that people will recognize that they've been um, desexed at an early age. We like to use absorbable skin sutures because they'll play with the skin sutures if, if they're there. And use care because the tissues are fragile and tear easily. And I remember the first time I did one and I was sort of pulling on the uterus and it came off in my hand and I was like, oh my God. And I went in to look for all of this bleeding and there was virtually none. So that made me very happy about doing these procedures. But just gentle tissue handling, which is how we do any, any type of surgery. And post-op, send them home the same day as soon as they wake up. You can continue the use of supplemental heat, such as a heat lamp, feed them a small meal as soon as they recover. And if there's a little bit sluggish with their recovery, check their temperature and give them a little glucose. But these, these guys do really well with this. And I think if more veterinarians would go ahead and bite the bullet and try and do it, we'd have a lot less objections to it. So in conclusion, I want to say that desexing is an important tool to reduce shelter intake and save animal lives. Uh, to be effective, we have to move beyond focusing on doing the shelter animals and get the public animals as well. And accompany this by education on responsible pet ownership. It's still up in the air about the optimum age for desexing, but certainly there's no reason to adhere to the six month age. And the other thing I want to say about this is that we're not going to desex our way out of this problem, just like we're not going to adopt our way out of this problem. It really does require education on responsible pet ownership. And the other thing we want to say to those private uh, practitioners that are still up in the air about this is that if you're not going to do it at um, six weeks or 10 weeks, try to time it before they reach sexual maturity, and that would be at about four months of age, which is typically when the vaccination series ends. But it still should be a decision between the um, private practitioner and the private owner. But in terms of dealing with pet homelessness, I think that we all need to embrace the uh, pediatric neutering, uh, desexing. <laughs> Darn, 
I didn't get it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>